I guess that Prof. Rodan would like to respond to a few doctor of Dr. Mazdi's uh, questions before we open the floor. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I think that the questions that you are uh, asking uh, are, are very important, in fact. And these are things that we have to clarify when we talk about these topics, because uh, sometimes it's, uh, the theories could give us the impression that uh, it's clear but we have to ask questions, by the way, to the subtext and, and, and sometimes to the non-set. And sometimes, yes, to the, the, of the pretext. About rule of law and, and the way uh, um, we have to deal with it, it's, it's true that when it comes to uh, talking about the rule of law, it's, it's the, the global framework. Now, we, when we come back to the Islamic tradition and we deal with Muslim scholars, it's clear that we have different interpretations of the le legal framework. And that for some, even for example, if you come and you ask here to the Muslims who are here, who are in this room, and you ask them about what is Sharia, you might have as many answers that you have people here in their understanding of Sharia. Uh, the problem is, it's a normative term, and when we are talking about Islam, you know, for example, now in Nahda, they have decided that the Sharia is not going to be in the Constitution, there is no need for this. In Egypt, they are, they are talking about it, saying there is no need for this, because of the misunderstanding. And, and also, because it's perceived as a, a, a threat, or it's scary for the non-Muslim citizens in the, in the society. Now, when it comes to rule of law, uh, and when even you had slogans in the past, Islam huwa al-hal, Islam is the solution, it's a slogan that we have to understand what was said and what was meant by the way it was said at the time it was said, and now to come to an understanding of how do we deal with the legal framework. So, for example, uh, we have in many countries, not in all the countries, constitution, a constitution and a legal framework. And the constitution is the fundamental law and, and the legal framework is also what is discussed by the parliament and sometimes we go back to the fund foundational uh, uh, reference. Uh, in, when it comes to the rule of law, what is important is to make it clear that it's true that uh, in the Islamic reference there are principles and there are fundamentals that they are uh, uh, going to be respected or at least put as reference. But the fact that the rule of law are the production of this discussion and dynamics that are uh, the, the, the product of what the people are doing in that field, it's very important. So very often we call it fiqh as differentiated from, you know, different from sharia. And this is an old, uh, uh, an old division. I even challenge this, in fact, because it's as if Sharia, in the legal sense, is only coming from the scriptural sources and it not, is not uh, going through a human agency, which I think is wrong. The old structure is still a human agency. You don't find the, 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 the framework within the Quran. There is something which is a human construction that is extracting the fundamentals, and now you have the fiqh, which is law and jurisprudence. It's not only jurisprudence, by the way. Fiqh is law and jurisprudence at the same time. And Sharia is wider than only law. So, in fact, Sharia is the way, and Fiqh is the way we deal with law within the way and try to implement this by dealing with new challenges, and this is jurisprudence. When it comes to the, the rule of law, this is why we have to deconstruct. And it's true that today, among the Muslim scholars and the Muslims, the answer is not always clear about how do we deal with this and how is it going to be dealt with. Even though, for example, now what we see in Muslim-majority countries, in, in, the, 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 in Tunisia, or in Egypt, in Turkey, for example, it's clear that they are acknowledging and accepting the fact that the parliament is working within the limits of the constitution, and sometimes we have to address the constitutional uh, reference. In, in the United States of America, there is a campaign against the Sharia, you know, the Sharia bills against the implementing Sharia, even in, in uh, states where there is no Muslims, they are still going for it. 
And the, the guy who is de behind it is saying, we want to make it a problem to understand that the Sharia is a problem for the West. So he wants to create controversy around this. But there is something which is important in our answer as Muslims. When, for example, as a Swiss citizen, I deal with a law in a country which is not a Muslim majority country, in Switzerland, for example. And this law is saying, for all the citizens, you should be equally treated before law. The law is saying that you are equal citizen. As a Muslim, and this is two ways of understanding, as a Muslim, this is my Sharia. It's not coming from a Muslim mind, but it's matching my principle. So by saying in the Swiss law that the, the, this is my Sharia, everything which is good, which is just, which is fair, is matching my Sharia, and I accept it. In the legal way, so also, this also was a, 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 a situation that happened in Egypt in the 40s, but my, my, my point here is really to say in the, when we come to the rule of law, do we, do we refer to Sharia as a closed system or as an open system with shared principles and it could take from others? My position is the, 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 the second position. But you, I agree with you that it's not clear. When you deal with the Salaf, and if were the first to tell me you are wrong, you can't call this Sharia. Because el -wala and el you are following the, the Muslims only and you cannot take this. So there is a discussion. So, so you should not, we should not avoid the complexity of this discussion among Muslims. And I think it's important, even among the reformists, by the way. Even among the, the people who are reformists. Very quickly about uh, the three other questions, because the first one, I think it's a very important, it's a deep one. In fact, it's a deep one, and, and we, are, we have to be very serious about this when it's come to rule of law. How do you deal with law, and how do you deal with the legal reference? The second is about the tyranny of majority. I mentioned six principles, and we, don't, we should not take the principles as, uh, as separate principles. If we say, yes, it's we go through the majority, we also have something which is balancing this principle by saying equal citizenships. So you cannot, for example, in a multi-racial, uh, multi-ethnic, multicultural societies, say you as Muslims, because you are a majority, you will give your citizens more rights and it, become, uh, it becomes the ty ty tyranny of uh, majority. We need to balance this by uh, individual rights and by the status within the society. And there is no other way. For us, for example, for example, in our societies, where well, now I'm saying to the West, your societies have changed. Now you have to get it exactly the way you said. You should face the reality your societies are pluralistic societies. So all the citizens are not, have not the same memory, not the same background, not the same religion, and they are here, and they are citizens, and you should get it. This is not to agree or not, it's a fact. It's history, this is it. Go with it because you have no choice. Now, by saying this, and the people are talking to me and they look at me and say, okay, you as a Swiss Muslim citizen and some Muslims even are themselves adding as a minority. And I respond, I'm sorry. As a Swiss, I am not a minority. There is no minority citizenship in this country. So anyone who is a Malaysian citizen should come with this standing point, which is don't talk about my citizenship as if I am a minority citizen. I'm a citizen, point, full stop. You get it? And this is we start the discussion. And then we are dealing with our... No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, because she's asking me to let you do, okay. Yalla. <laughs> so this is, uh, this, is an important, this is an important attitude that we have, and I think that this is why we are balancing the two, even though I agree, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, we cannot avoid something which is uh, uh, the majority standing on, on cultural term, on, on historical term, by saying, still you are welcome in our society. Uh, but we have to challenge this. We have to challenge this. And, and for example, when we are told, you know, you are a Swiss citizen with an immigrant background, I respond to them by saying, I'm sorry, the difference between you and me is that you are an older immigrant. That's it. You are just an old, but you are like me. So in history, but it's a very important point. You put things in history and say, don't, don't take me like this. You know, you, you are just, uh, it's not because uh, you are Swiss for a longer time that you are better Swiss. 
exactly the same for the Malaysian. It's exactly the same that we have to come. Equal citizen means don't tell me about your history that you built the country. Now I'm here and I'm going, the point is not where do you come from, is where we are going together. So take it like this. This is the future of our societies as citizens where we are going together. And then what you were saying about uh, ethics, uh, it's true. Anyone, as any citizen, is going to come with his background, and this is what we have to respect. Some are Christians, some are Buddhists, and they came with their ethics. The point with ethics is when it comes to the reference, of course, a everyone will act in his political life, social life, with his ethical background. We should not avoid this as something don't talk about your ethics to come to the common ground. We should respect the fact that we have a common ground and everyone is coming, but it cannot be imposing ethics. It should be discussing the shared ethics of the nation. And I, will, I can tell you that if you are serious about this, you will see that with the Buddhists, with the, 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 the Hinduists, with the, the, the Christians, with Muslims, you will find, and even people who have no religions, they come with morality, with ethics. We have shared principles, and we can come to this. So it's not a competition of ethical references, it's a participation, it's an open discussion. If we avoid talking about this, we are creating the conditions for a competition that is a bad competition. If we are open about this and we open the floor for a critical discussion, this is where we are creating a constructive competition. There are two kinds of competitions, the negative and the constructive. I'm advocating the fact that all these people who don't want to speak about ethics, they are opening the floor and, and paving the way for very negative discussions. At the end, we, are, we end up counting how many converts, how many people, this, this, you know, this very superficial and very, very dangerous attitude. And the point that we, in fact, the answer to the last question is coming from what you said. The reference to what I have been saying in all my work on radical reform and all this. In fact, all what I'm saying about the models, about you know, reforming the society, has to do with Islam, has to do with reform. Now, once again, to be serious with the text doesn't mean that you change the text, but you change your mind because the context is different. And three things should help you to change your mind. The first uh, dimension is time. With time, you should to reassess the way you are dealing with the text. The texts are eternal, but you are within history. And within history, you have to deal in a new way with the same text. The second is cultures and geographical changes is space, that you find yourself in different ways, and now in Malaysia, it's not Saudi Arabia, it's not the Arab culture, this is, you have to deal with it. And there is another thing which is important, is diversity. And this is why I keep on repeating to Muslims, when you keep on yourself quoting the Quran, you made, we, we made you, Allah is saying, we made you tribes and nations in order for, for you to know each other. It's very important, this challenge of knowledge, that very often the people, the Muslims, are asking the non-Muslims to know more about Islam. But the verse is not saying this. It's saying, لِتَعَارَفُوا it means you yourself should know more about the Chinese culture and civilization, about the Buddhists and the Buddhist spirituality, about the Christians, about the other. Why? Why is it important to know? Just for the, not for the knowledge, for not for the sake of knowledge, because it gives you a way of changing your mind. You are learning from other. Intellectual humility through the knowledge of other is part of what is good in a multicultural society. If you celebrate this, not by sitting here and say, you know what, it's a diversity, celebrate. No, this is not what we mean. To celebrate diversity is to make it clear that in our schools, we know from each other. And we take, it helps us to change our mind. These are the three factors of Islam, time, space, diversity. This is where we should work together. Wallahu Thank you very much, uh, Prof.